a tisket, a tasket, my little pollen basket. <laughs> oh, I love it. Welcome to Electric Enthusiasm, the podcast where we celebrate unironic enthusiasm. It's unbelievable. I haven't <laughs> talked about this yet. I'm Katie Cobalt. <laughs> yes, and I'm Alexander Kiewith, and today's topic has me all a buzz. Hey. <laughs> I like that both of us came out the gate with puns ready to rock. Yeah. <laughs> so, Alex, tell us how this works. All right. Here's how it works. In each episode, one of us presents a topic that they love, but that the other one might know little to nothing about. And then the host will try their damnedest to spread their enthusiasm to the other host and to you, the listener. Sometimes we have amazing guests on who are super excited about something that we know nearly nothing about. And we also have the Moment of Meta, where we nerd out about enthusiasm itself and talk about why it matters and how you can live a more enthusiastic <laughs> life. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because let's face it, the world needs more enthusiasm, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we're trying to create here on the podcast. And you should share your enthusiasms with us. You can go to our website, electricenthusiasm.com. You could go on our Instagram, at electricenthusiasm. Tell us what you're excited about these days. You can even plain old send us an email at hello at electricenthusiasm.com. So what are we talking about, Katie, that is so unbelievable? <laughs> Today, we're gonna have a little buzz about bees. Alex, what do you know about bees? <laughs> I've, I've seen a bee once. Uh, I think once? My, Only once? What, <laughs> I think my, my knowledge of bees is about the same as the average layperson, you know, hives, honey, uh, buzzing, sting you. Uh, I do know one one fun fact about bees. So what is the one fun fact? Well, they dance. Yes, uh, they do. Yes, they do. And there were some Danish researchers who built a mechanical bee. <laughs> of course, they did. <laughs> yes, they had a like a fake bee on a on a robot arm that they could move around, and they could dance yeah. for the other bees, and then see if they had correctly communicated to the bees where they should go, and they did. Oh, man. Okay. Well, we'll talk about the wag. It's called the waggle dance. Exactly. We'll talk about that later today. Okay. We should start with the first things first. Yes. Yes. Facts first. We like to start with the facts first around here, Katie. What should a person know about bees? First of all, there is over 20,000 different species of bees in Holy the shit. world. And they're found in pretty much every continent except Antarctica. They are one of the most efficient flower pollinators of the natural world. I was going to say of the insect world. I realized, no, of the natural world. Uh-huh. You have three different types of bees in a hive. I'm going to mostly be focusing on honeybees because they're mm -hmm. my favorite. But yeah, generally speaking, in a hive, you'll have worker bees, drones, and queens. Uh -huh. Worker bees, if you see a bee, you probably have seen a worker bee. She's a sexually underdeveloped female and she'll never lay eggs. Her job, because they all have jobs, is quite extensive. She cleans the hive, cares for the queen, feeds the brood, constructs the comb, processes incoming nectar to turn it into honey, and also guards the entrance of the hive. The worker bees are called that because they do the work. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Makes sense. That tracks. You have the queen. There's one queen in every single hive, and her job is pretty much to just lay eggs. She can lay about 1,500 eggs in a single day. And about a million eggs in a lifetime. If she's Whoa. a very productive queen, about a million eggs. Wow. That is that is like a hell of a job <laughs> just to just lay eggs consistently <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Her secondary function is to produce pheromones. So bees have a very complicated pheromone communication structure, which we'll get into a little bit later. But they kind of keep the hive together, keeps everyone on the same page. And that's kind of like one of her main jobs. And then the final type of bee that you will probably never see is the drones. The drones are the males of the bee species. They have no stinger. They have no pollen. Ba pollen baskets are the little things on their hind legs that cut to the pollen. Yeah. And pollen is a really great protein source for bees. Uh -huh. And also they're called pollen baskets. And that just makes my heart really happy. <laughs> a tisket, a tasket, my little pollen basket. <laughs> oh, oh, I love it. I just think it's such a cute name for them. Anyways, the male species don't have stingers, don't have pollen baskets. They're pretty much useless. Mm -hmm. They have no function aside from fertilizing eggs for the queen. They're not really that interesting. The queen workers, they're super cool. The males, I get it. You have to be here. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> got it got it got it got it i'm gonna do one quick myth bust and then we're gonna get into why we're talking about bees mm -hmm. not all bees die after stinging you oh because i think that's a really commonly held belief that we all have like 
If a bee stings you, it's going to die immediately. Yeah. For some species of bees, like some honeybees, that is always true because mm-hmm. the stinger is attached to their intestinal system, which means that when they sting you, that all gets ripped out of their bodies and then they will definitely die. However, the stinger is actually well attached enough that if the skin is thin enough, the bees can sting repeatedly and defend the hive, basically. And so they can sting other insects with no problem, but us mammals, we're a bit too thick-skinned for them. Got it. Uh, Any then, clue why this evolutionary adaptation happened? I do have answers for you on this, but okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sneaky and say, like, not yet. Ooh, I will excellent. explain more about why bees will lay down their lives to protect a hive I'm later excited. in the podcast. Exciting. We should maybe explain there's a, the reason why we keep saying bees is... There's a Cards Against Humanity card, which is just bees with a question mark, and it's one of my favorite cards in the Cards Against Humanity pack of all time. And apparently not only you, because I did send you that picture of somebody who had gotten the bees, question mark, tattooed on their arm. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to list some things, and I want you to tell me if you like these things. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy coffee, apples, peaches, walnuts, watermelons, cashews, eggplants, blueberries, grapes, kiwis, mangoes, cranberries, okra, pearl, peppers, strawberries, avocados, or cucumbers? (laughs) Well, I'm sitting here with a cup of coffee right now. (laughs) Uh, So the answer to all of those is yes, 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 and hell yeah. So if you enjoy any of these products, you love bees. Because without (laughs) bees, we would not have any of these products. Almost one third of the world's crops are pollinated by bees. If they went extinct, we would starve to death very quickly after that. So the reason why I like bees is because I like food. And also they're cute. (laughs) (laughs) I too enjoy food on occasion. Yes. Yes. On, only sometimes. Only sometimes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, uh, what are some other species that also pollinate? You know, if we didn't have bees, what who would take up the slack? But that's the thing. Like they are the most efficient pollinators. Yeah. There is people who own hives who their job is to just transport the hives to like an almond orchard. So their whole job is at night. They load up their beehives. They drive to the orchard and they set up camp. For like a day or two then they wait in the evening when all the bees return back to the hive and they drive to the next orchard and that's like how some people earn a living they just travel around the continental united states or anywhere where there is lots of agriculture and they just pollinate because at the commercial scale which we're producing food there is not another pollinator that can pick up the slack it's right. kind of like bees or starvation okay like that's okay. kind of our only option i just like the bees there is a lot of factors at the moment, like colony collapse, parasites, and of course, our old favorite global warming that are mm-hmm. affecting bee populations around the world. And so we need to look after the bees because we need them deeply to survive. Yep. So that's one of the reasons why I think bees are wonderful and so important to our world, because we would literally starve without them. But they're also very fascinating creatures. I think they are so cool. I like evolutionary biology and I love seeing how different animals have adapted to the environments that they live in. And I think bees are one of the coolest animals in that regard. Wow. Wow. Number two reason why I think bees are dope is because of the way they communicate. So we talked about this a little bit already. Mm -hmm. They do a little dance. Yeah. It's called a waggle dance. And what it is, is they'll go in a little straight line whilst shaking their booties. And then they'll curve around and go back on themselves and curve around and go back on themselves. Well, it makes a little bit of a figure eight. The speed and which the direction that bee is traveling will communicate to her sisters where the best food is. So not only do they travel miles upon miles every day to go find food, they come back and they communicate to their sisters, hey, here's where all the flowers are. Here's where the best pollen is. Here's where you should head to as well. And I think that's very, very cool. Yes, that is so cool. So last night, I met a bee guy. (gasps) What a (laughs) random happy sense. (laughs) We're at a social dance in Copenhagen, and Oliver Maxwell was there. And Oliver Maxwell runs Bupi, City Bee. I think I mentioned that project (gasps) before. And I mentioned, don't spoil it for me, but I am doing this podcast tomorrow on bees. (laughs) Yeah. First of all, you said that the bee population in Copenhagen is declining. Global warming is part of that. Yep. And then he also said that not only do the bees dance, they sing. Yeah. There's, this is a fairly new discovery. Apparently, there's an audible component to the dance. 
And here's here's yeah. how he explained it. Some flowers, when a bee is approaching, that specific vibration of the bee's wings, the flower will produce some sweeter nectar. And then the bee yes. goes in there, gets that nectar, and is like, oh my God, this is amazing. I got to hurry back to the hive and tell all my sisters about it. And and it does and doesn't waggle dance. And there's, so there's cool. this fairly new discovery is that there's also an auditory component to the waggle dance. So they, they dance and they sing. I think that's just amazing. I love that they communicate. That's so cool. And also yeah. like communicate through dance and singing. That's very much my thing. Like, I love that. I love communicating yes, through dancing. Yes, it is from an evolutionary perspective. How the hell did that evolve? That is, it's just so Crazy. cool. Are there any, any other examples? I mean, birds, they're in the mating dances. Yep. But that's more yeah. about impressing one other member of your species. And some of those dances are very impressive and some of those are very goofy. But are there any other examples of like communicating to your group, to your tribe, to your uh, hive through dancing in the animal kingdom? In terms of communication between animals, as far as I understand, obviously I am not an expert. I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> Anytime you have anybody that's in a, in a herd, you have to have some sort of communication. So if you look at the way in which dogs play, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of body language going back and forth to be able to communicate when is playtime starting, when is playtime over. And like when you watch them, they'll, they'll crouch down and stand up and crouch down and yeah. stand up and they synchronize on that. And that often like looks like dancing to our eye because like we like rhythm and we like movement. Yeah. But whether we'd call that dancing is another thing entirely. Sure. sure. But yeah, any pack animal would probably have body language as a form of communication as well. Yeah. Wow. Another way in which bees communicate, particularly honeybees, have one of the most complex pheromonal communication systems in the natural world. So there's two types of different pheromones that mostly the queen would release. You have things that are called releaser pheromones. These elicit an immediate temporary behavioral change. So it's like a pheromone will come out and be like, all right, boys, it's time for sexy times. And like that means like, <laughs> get your shit together, let's go. But then you also have like alarm pheromones, like the everybody freak out. There's somebody entering the hive that shouldn't be here. So often you will see beekeepers with a smoke. Mm -hmm. or there's lots of debates among beekeepers is what the smoke actually does. Some people think that the smoke clouds the signal. So like if you have too much smoke in the air, the pheromones can't be received. But also some people think that bees will hide from the smoke the way we would hide from smoke. It's a different, there are lots of different ways of thinking about it. But one of my favorite ways in which bees will communicate in terms of release of pheromones is the oi get over here pheromone basically <laughs> one of the things that i really love watching on youtube is something called texas bee works which is this woman who does bee removals and she's just very calm and sweet she doesn't use bee vacuums bee vacuums make me really sad because that seems very traumatizing to a bee but she does like these little close-up shots where when she started taking some of the bees out of whatever temporary home they've created and moving them into a hive you can see the bees lining up on the edge of the hive, sticking their butts out and then flapping their wings like crazy to blow pheromones, essentially. <laughs> These little release of pheromones out into the world being like, yo, this is home now. I don't know where you guys are, but you should be over here. <laughs> I, have, I have seen her. Also, she's not in a bee suit or a hat. No, She's just scooping no. out handfuls of bees with her bare hands. She's basically the bee whisperer, right? She's amazing. I think she's a really good person for helping people get over their fear of bees because yeah. she's approaching them very calmly, very slowly, without any of that safety equipment. She's showing us that you can approach a hive and like help them. So that's the first type of pheromone you have, the release of pheromone. Interesting. Another type of pheromone that you might have is the primer pheromone. These have long lasting effects. So this is more like the type of pheromone that the queen will release to kind of maintain balance within the hive. So for example, if you have a lot of worker bees at the moment and there's like just too much worker bees and not quite enough honey to like balance that out, she might release a primer pheromone which will slow down the development of the brood. Holy shit. They want to maintain balance within the hive and that's like number one priority. And so you have these primer pheromones that can actually slow down development or change how a bee is functioning within the hive and have a long lasting effect. That is just fascinating. Wow. Isn't it just? It, so it cool. blows my mind. Did not know that. So cool. And for me, this links really nicely with the final thing that I want to talk about, which is also like the hardest thing for me to explain. So 
Do you know what you sociality is? Uh, like pro social behavior, or, like, or so it's not pro social. It's you social behavior. It's uh-huh. specifically different. Uh huh. So this is the coolest shit for me. This is the why bees work together the way they do. This kind of answers the evolutionary questions we were talking about before. So, Alex, if you were to say there was one goal for all species on this earth, if you're an alive biological creature on this earth, what mm-hmm. is your goal, do you think? What is like promoting, the end game? Like promoting the furthering the species, you know, um, the next generation. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Reproduction to pass on one's genetic material. That is like the end game for all of us, theoretically. And yet, in a hive, in a colony, most of the workers are sexually underdeveloped. They cannot lay eggs. They cannot have children. And yet, will still work endlessly for their queen, build incredibly complex structures, control territory, and would even sacrifice their lives for their hive. Mm -hmm. If you think about this for like more than a second, it's kind of insane. Like, it's almost like survival of the fittest doesn't apply to them. They will donate all of their foraging efforts, all of their food to the hive. Mm -hmm. And this is because the level of cooperations that bees have goes so much deeper than just working together. So this is where being a social animal, so like humans are social animals, pack animals, social animals, is different from being a you social animal. So this is when the the genetics comes into this. Okay, we're going to (laughs) explain some genetic stuff yes when we as a species reproduce our offspring roughly has about half the dna from each parents right so like for example two people have a baby half the dna comes from one parent half the dna comes to the other parent Mm -hmm. yes yeah so the insect order which uh, bees are part of called hymenopterans which includes bees ants and wasps have kind of broken this this idea of 50-50, and then like that's not a thing anymore with these species. They use a form of pathogenic reproduction in which unfertilized eggs develop into males and fertilized eggs develop into females called erinotaki. Mm-hmm. So this means that the fathers will always have identical genetic information. Ah. There'll be more similarities in the genetic material shared between sisters than in other reproductive methods because all of the males have identical genetic material. So any daughters of the queen are semi-clones of one another. They right. share about 75% of the same DNA as each other. So if you have queen, worker bees below, they all share 75% of their genetic DNA. Wow. Which means if a worker bee was to produce offspring of her own, they would only contain 50% of her DNA. So now this changes the primary objective of life because if the idea of life, the end goal, we talked about this, pass on genetic material. If that is the end goal, any worker bee is going to be able to pass on more genetic material by assisting the queen, protecting the hive and her sisters, then reproducing themselves. Yes, that makes sense. I can see that. Which is why the bees are willing to do absolutely anything to assist their queen. Because yep. genetically speaking, it is more beneficial for them in the long run to be able to do that than it is to have babies themselves. Yep. Fascinating. Which explains why they are willing to do what they're willing to do for the hive. One of the ways in which the worker bees will defend the hive is, for example, if a very large wasp tries to attack the hive, They'll all just like crowd them and vibrate at a high frequency, which causes the wasp to heat up and then just basically cook. Yeah. yeah. Um, when a bear comes along, like bears are mammals, their skin is too thick. They will die when they sting them. The bees will just like go for it because a swarm of bees attacking you is enough to make a bear fuck off. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, did I read somewhere that they they do go specifically for like eyes and ears? Yeah, and noses as well. And noses yeah, and, and other uh, vulnerable spots. And of course, we learned from the Nobel Prize episode where on the body it is most painful to get stung by a bee. Yeah. There was the, the Dutch guy who stung yeah, himself in 25 different that. places. Yeah, and most painful was the nose and the penis. I just... I, I still don't understand why he would do that. It just doesn't seem like a very fun experiment. Anyways, so this particular form of reproduction 
allows bees and other hymopterans to have this incredibly insane self-sacrifice in which they're not really playing as individual characters anymore. They're playing as a team strategy. And so it's more beneficial for them to think about the team. And it's really interesting because you have hyper specialization, right? In other species, you can't have the male of the species being completely useless. You have to have everybody kind of being able to survive by themselves. But because they have this particular form of reproduction, the Renataki, it allows them to have the specialization in which there is only one person producing eggs. That is their only job. One of the reasons why they are able to produce honey, to produce a shelf-stable, long-lasting food source that can survive through winters or through famines or through like moments where they can't find enough flowers, they have a backlog of honey. And yeah. most species can't produce that level of food storage because they don't have this sense of dedication to the collective, yeah. right? If you think about a pack of lions, they're not going to have food storage. Because everybody's not in it for the only breeding pair. They're in it for themselves to one day breed. Yeah. And I mean, I think early humans didn't have the foresight to put anything aside. You know, if you killed an animal, you ate all of it right away because it would mm-hmm. spoil. We didn't have the, the, the intelligence, the foresight to even create long-term food supplies. Yeah. And yeah. they've been doing it this whole damn time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I've read somewhere that some biologists actually think it makes more sense to look at the whole colony as one organism or like an entire ant hive as one organism. I mean, of course, it's comprised as of individual organisms, just as we're comprised of individual cells. But it makes sense to look at the whole thing as like, here's one one animal, basically. Yeah. In, in... It's because like they're all working as one unit. Yeah. And this is why like the bees are open to having that pheromonal changes from the queen because they recognize that the benefit to them is to have the queen survive and produce offspring. Yeah. And to do a quick like detour, this is also true for a lot of ant species as well. I don't like ants as much as I like bees. I find bees inherently adorable. (laughs) But leafcutter ants are another really great example of animals working collectively as a group because they also have the same reproductive system in order to basically destroy an entire forest. Like leafcutter ants go into the wild cut leaves into like little discs and then bring them home to the hive, not to eat themselves, but because they have a farm inside their anthill, they'll bring the leaves back and they have a colony of fungus that they're growing and that's what they eat. So they will decimate an entire forest, cause all the trees in the area to freak out because trees can communicate as well. So they'll send a chemical through the root system to the other trees being like, everybody panic, the ants are here. And it causes the trees to release a chemical into their leaves to make the leaves taste disgusting to try and get the ants to fuck off. But leafcutter ants can like fully take out an entire tree within a day, bring all of the leaves back to their anthill, and then they'll feed it to the fungus. And then the fungus is what they eat. So they're basically doing low-key agriculture there where they're like taking a crop, bringing it home and feeding it to their food. Wow. Also, ants keep, they keep pets. Uh, little aphids, right? Yes. That they, that they basically milk for sugar water. Yeah. Yeah. Also in a lot of different ant species, you have a lot of different specializations. So in bees, you kind of have like the drones and the queen and the workers. But in ant species, you also have like soldier ants who will be like much bigger that'll take out any enemies. Some ants are specialized. There's something called a trapdoor ant, which on, he looks like he's wearing a giant flat hat. <laughs> And so if there are ants who are burrowing inside of a tree or something and there's like a small hole at the entrance, there's an ant whose entire job it is to stick his head into the <laughs> hole so that no <laughs> other animals can get in. Oh, that's hilarious. Anyway, I need to get a picture of these. Oh, there he is. <laughs> he is basically wearing a, like a huge serving platter on his head. Yeah. And there he is plugging <laughs> yeah, uh, the hole, thing. which is, by, by the way, perfectly sized for the plug. Wow. Wow. Just yeah, wow. Yeah, so they... they, they They drill these holes or eat these holes out themselves. Yeah. And then they make it the perfect size to fit his little hat. Can he get into the hive or is he, he he can't, right? No, no. No, He can get in. He can get in. Okay, okay, okay. He just goes in backwards, I think. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. Quick, by the way, here, uh, there's the the hive mind, the hive society Mm -hmm. is a a classic sci-fi trope. Yes, uh, it you is. see that in a, you have like a invasion of the body snatchers or you have the Borg in Star Trek or like in a million other sci-fi settings. And it's always terrified me 
being being like subsumed, having your intelligence subsumed into this larger collective consciousness. I think yeah. it's one of the most terrifying sci-fi tropes. And I think a it lot is, of it is, but it, yeah. until until you can no longer sexually re reproduce as an individual, I'm like it could be worse. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that. Yeah, yeah, but so it's a quick one today. But that's why I like bees. One, I think they're very cute. Two, I like to eat honey and also the other products that the bees allow for us to be able to consume. And I just think it's so cool. I think the method of reproduction and how it affects their behavior is so fascinating. We we talked about mating habits on this show before. Like I find animal mating habits particularly interesting. Um, and I think this is a very specific way of kind of like breaking the game when it comes to passing on one's genetic material. It's like, I'm not going to have babies. I'm going to have clone sisters. Yeah. Oh, I completely forgot to ask you, how do we feel about the bee movie? I've never actually seen it. It's not very good. From what I've heard, it's about a male bee. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, why the drones are the least interesting aspect of the bee world. Exactly. And also, doesn't he have a relationship with a woman, like a human he, woman? Exactly. That's the whole plot. It's, it's a rom-com with a bee and a human woman. That seems deeply weird. It, it is. Like, truly is. Deeply weird. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How about ant? How about ants? Have you seen that? Ants is great. I love ants. Yeah. I love Bugs Life. <laughs> Excellent yeah. films. I was yeah. definitely that weird kid in the playground that was interested in the bugs in the dirt. <laughs> that was that was 100% me. That's awesome. That is awesome. So, Alex, now that you've learned a little bit about why bees are so friggin' cool, what do you think about bees? Bees? I had no idea they were so freaking cool. The whole the genetic thing, the pheromone thing, that's just insane. There's just so much fascinating stuff in how they work together. I have gained a completely new and even deeper appreciation and, dare I say it, enthusiasm for yes. bees. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, they're cool. Also, they're kind of cute, right? With their little fuzzy they're behinds. And can I tie this back to one of our other podcast episodes? Go for it. In one of the Vorkosigan books, He's like, he thinks bees are pretty snazzy because they have like little yellow and black striped uniforms and they carry swords. That is true. They do do those things. Yeah, exactly. Actually, speaking of their yellow and black uniforms, many other insects have imitated their uniforms like hoverflies. You see loads of like false bees in the insect kingdom because yeah. they're just like, well, the bees look pretty freaking cool and everyone's scared of them. So I'm going to look pretty freaking cool and everyone's going to be scared of me. Yeah. Also, can we just agree? Bees, awesome. Wasps, hornets, not so much. Yeah, no, I don't like them as much. No, no, no. no. no I'm, I'm no, very no, no. pro B. Pro B, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pro B. Pro B. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katie, if a person wanted to learn more about bees, where should they go? I am going to link a bunch of YouTube videos in which it gives you a little bit more information about bees, as well as to Texas Bee Works, which is my number one favorite place yeah. to go look at bees. One of my favorite things that she does in her videos is when she's found the queen, she'll do a close-up shot of the hive where the queen is. And I always like to play the game of, can I see the queen before she points it out to me? Because um, it's always quite fun to try and spot the queen. Yep. That's a really fun game. A game of where's Waldo. It's like the ultimate where's Waldo because yep. everyone is wearing Waldo's colors. Yeah. And finally, the thing that I think everyone should be mindful of is we want to protect the bees and keep the bees alive for as long as possible. So this involves if there is a local honey producer or an apiary near you, go support them. Buy honey, buy some beeswax. If you have access to a garden or somewhere where you can grow flowers, grow local bee-friendly flowers in your neighborhood, in your garden, in your balcony, wherever you have a little bit of space. Some flowers are never going to be a sad thing for you or for the bees. And if you're super keen on helping support your local bees, you can get bee hotels, which are the cutest things ever. They use these little boxes with little holes where, for example, if a bee is out foraging, they might need someone to hide for a little bit if it starts to rain, or they might need a little bit of shade. You can get these little bee hotels put near your garden, and they can just go hang out there. There's loads of different ways that you can also be helping out the bee population in your area. Feel free to look them up, see if there's any apiaries or beekeepers near you who might need some support. We They're so cute. Save, gotta save the bees. They're cute and they give us food and we like food. Exactly. And also the final most important thing you must remember, if you see any photos of 
drunk on nectar bees sticking out of flowers with pollens on their butts, you must send them to me because those are definitely my kind of cute photo. And if you see any, I want to see them too. Please and thank you. (laughs) This is your homework. (laughs) Got it. So dear listener, what did you think about the bees? Do you have any questions or should we leave out something awesome about bees? (laughs) Go to our website or our Instagram at Electric Enthusiasm and leave a comment. Yeah, I just remembered <laughs> apparently even elephants are scared of bees. Everyone's scared of bees. They yeah. are terrifying. If, if yeah. a swarm of bees is coming for you, that's scary. Did you see that meme? There was like somebody posted that elephants have a sound that means there are bees nearby, be careful. And they were wondering, why don't humans have that sound? And somebody else posted, well, we do. It sounds like this. There are bees nearby, be careful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. Moment of meta? Moment of meta. Moment of meta. I thought it was time to review our enthusiasms. Yay. We've had nine of them so far and just such to give people an overview of some good ways to approach enthusiasm and how to mm-hmm. be more enthusiastic. How Up for it? Be more enthusiastic? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I heard the pun and I couldn't not like, go for it. To be or not to be. Yeah. Yeah, let's stop. <laughs> I'm going to stop with the beef one. <laughs> you introduce the first one. You should introduce, take the first one. It's my favorite. Number one, don't yuck someone else's yum. This is the idea that if someone is enthusiastic about it, and you might not be, do not harsh their buzz. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry. I, I enjoy that one. That was great. <laughs> If someone's deeply enjoying something, let them enjoy the thing. It's not hurting you. Leave them Exactly. Alone. Of course, with the one exception of, of Game of Thrones. Well, that's not anyone's yum. No, but it's always okay to <laughs> rag on Game of Thrones. Enthusiasm number two. I'm really passionate about this one, which is that any topic can be fascinating if it's presented with enthusiasm. I don't care what it is. Accounting, garbage renovation, a needlepoint, knitting, buttonhole sewing. I don't care. If it's presented with enough enthusiasm and insight, any topic in the world can be absolutely fascinating and something you can dive into and learn more about. It's, it's easy to stay within, you know, the topics you already love and just be fascinated by those. But if once you go exploring, as we did in one of the episodes, right, when we talked about it, I talked about pastel painting mm-hmm. and you talked about the pastel painter in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, these yeah, the artist. Random portraits. Once you dive yeah. into a topic, any topic can be absolutely fascinating. Number three, make sure to share your enthusiasms enthusiastically. You are not too much. As number two states, you are fascinating if you're presenting with enthusiasm and to feel no shame in the enthusiasm game and just go for it because you will never be too much. You will be the perfect amount of much, as you said in that episode, which I thought was great. (laughs) If you are enthusiastic about something, let's say hypothetically you're in a, in a movie theater and you're watching everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and you're cheering loudly for the good scenes in the movie, which are all it of the scenes the in the movie. It was the fanny pack fight scene. It was the fanny pack fight scene that got me. I fully cheered at that one. That was so <laughs> that good. Was, that was so good. And if somebody else is like, that's too much, maybe you shouldn't, you know, uh, screw them. It's okay to be enthusiastic. It's always okay to be enthusiastic. Yeah. They broke with enthusiasm number one, so they should feel bad about themselves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> enthusiasm done before, thou shalt not fake enthusiasm. It's never good to fake any kind of emotions. If you're not enthusiastic about something, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You don't have to fake that you are. Be really enthusiastic about the things you are excited about, then yeah. leave them to those who are enthusiastic. Yeah. Number five, you don't have to participate in something to be enthusiastic about it. Like, for example, I don't currently have an apiary or a beehive, (laughs) and yet I am deeply enthusiastic (laughs) about bees. And hope one day I might have an apiary. (laughs) Yeah. Also, I think that came out of our ultra marathon episode where we talked to Mark, who runs these epic ultra marathon races, like 75, 100K up and down mountains and through rivers and Mm. like. That's awesome. So great to hear about not doing that ever. Yes. Ever. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for sharing your enthusiasm with us. It was very cool. I'm very excited about this thing, and I will never do it. And then, of course, we have number six, which I think we can call the J.K. Rowling, which is it's okay to be enthusiastic about something that is flawed. Nothing's mm-hmm. perfect. Everything is flawed. Uh, J.K. Rowling is a turf, and that's just the way mm-hmm. it is. But you can still love Harry Potter, and you're not a bad person if you do. Yeah. No, nope. But... 
Well, you can also, number seven, be enthusiastic about people. Always tell your friends and those around you what you like about them. It's very hard sometimes to see the wonderful things inside of yourself and see all the ways in which you make the world more sparkly. And so it's really great sometimes if you can help everyone else out around you. So if you see something awesome about your friends or family or loved ones, feel free to get enthusiastic about them. And remember to share your enthusiasm enthusiastically. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Enthusiasm number eight is that you don't have to be an expert in something to be enthusiastic about that something. If mm -hmm. you love a movie, if you love everything, everywhere, all at once, you love that movie and that's fine. However, if you do spend hours and hours, you know, going into interviews and making off videos and IMDb trivia about that movie, as some persons here have done. I don't know what you're uh, talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you might find that your enthusiasm for that, that something deepens and becomes even richer and that thing becomes even more interesting to you. I can tell you that our last episode of the Tubular Bells, they, I've had that album for 40 years. When I researched it, I learned so much stuff that I didn't even know. And it, yeah. and it just made me appreciate that work of art even more. That was a good example of that. Also, I have been listening to it over and over since we uh, shot the episode. Because <laughs> it's so good. It's just so good. And finally, number nine is to seek out adjacent enthusiasms. So this was our idea about if you like this thing, this thing is very closely associated to that thing. Maybe you want to also try that thing as well and expand your range of enthusiasms yes excellent the sharp eyed listener sharp eared listener <laughs> might have noticed so the that elves we... the elves in the audience exactly <laughs> might have noticed that we have we have nine enthusiasms that's of course deeply unsatisfying there ought to be 10 so uh, if anybody has an idea a suggestion a notion for what the next enthusiasm might be uh reach out tell us about it in the comments send us an email mm -hmm. at hello at electric enthusiasm Dot com so we can make it an even 10. I will make a little graphic of these in current enthusiasms and I'll pop Ooh. them on our Instagram as well Good. so that people can have a look at that. And then like number 10, yeah. question mark. Yeah, we need a number 10. We got a comment on YouTube on our Everything Everywhere All at Once episode from Photo Girl Films saying, great review. Glad you enjoyed this special film as much as I did. And then we got a comment from Colin Fu going into the Chinese language. Hokkien is a Chinese dialect. The national main language of China is a Mandarin. And the Chinese dialects are may, make... I'm going to rephrase. So there's Chinese dialects that are part of different provinces in China. Cantonese is commonly found in Guangzhou and is also spoken in Hong Kong. I agree with that. Thank you, Colin. Then Teochew, Hokchou, Hakka, Hainanese. These are all different types of Chinese dialects and also respond to different people as well and different cuisines as well. Uh, I think maybe you've heard of Hainanese chicken rice. That's like probably the most famous of all the things I see there. But it's a very specific type of chicken rice from Hainanese province. I think this is a really interesting comment. I think from the Western perspective, China and Chinese is all the same, right? It's just China. Yep. But it's a huge country. It's massive. And within China, there are different types of Chinese people. Like, my mom asks this question all the time of all of my friends. I don't know why she does. don't know why it's insignificant to her. But when she meets my friends, she'll ask them, like, ah, what type, like, where's your family from? Are you Hakka? Are you Fujian province? Are you Hokkien? It's part of, like, understanding someone deeper. It's understanding where their family is from. What dialects do they speak? What food traditions do they have? Because it's all very specific and regional. Because, again massive country it's like saying somebody's european <laughs> yeah. it's not a useful data point not really no not really no no thanks for yeah. that comment colin Fu. yeah katie if somebody liked this episode of electric enthusiasm what other episode do you think they'd also enjoy what should they listen to next I mean, the animal mating habits is a great place to go because we are talking about animal mating habits. And also, I think that's a really fun episode. I really love having Yo there and like the three of us were just hilarious together. Yeah. yeah. I really like that one. Oh, so it was a bunch of fun. If I can make a ra completely random suggestion based go on this. It. Yeah, the Bioshock episode. Because that one yeah, also had sure. like hive mind stuff and it had <laughs> yeah, pher totally. pheromone control. That's and, true. Yeah, and soldiers and fighting. And yeah, the, the computer game Bioshock had, uh, is definitely inspired by the animal kingdom. 
parasites and pheromones and that kind of thing. Completely different topic, but some of the same elements come through in that as well. Concepts, exactly. <laughs> that was the word I was looking for. We hope you enjoyed sharing some of our enthusiasms in this episode. Please visit our website, electricenthusiasm.com, or find us on Instagram at electricenthusiasm to discover more episodes or to leave a comment. And now, dear listener, go open a bee hotel. Oh, yes, please do. Save the bees. <laughs> <laughs>